women are just as important as men even if we function a little different or we think a little differently or um, we have different roles it that doesn't mean somebody should receive less respect or less honor or less dignity or should be treated different because again we're all at the very end we all have the spirit of god in us we all are sons of god by adoption once we're baptized and we are born into the church the body of christ just because we are assigned different roles and tasks it doesn't mean uh, we have different degrees of honor or um, different levels of worth i want us to again to start off on a very dark note look at what happened with the sons of korah when they weren't very satisfied with the role god gave them i mean you, you look it up for yourself but let me just summarize what happened for you they all died and it was ugly you're living under a rock if you think women priests didn't exist in pagan worship before and during and after the time of Christ. Women priests were all over the place in pagan worship. But Christ still chose 12 male disciples and 70 apostles. And again, it should be that simple. It ends there, right? There's different roles. It doesn't mean one is over the other, or one is better than the other, or he prefers one over the other. As, as I mean... Just please let's dig through the Gospels. The Gospel is filled, filled with examples of the Lord honoring and, and truly going against some of the Jewish traditions, actually, of dishonoring women. So Christ was a revolutionary in that way, even though I don't like to use that term because then we take it into politics and we don't do that. But uh, again, Christ, without being a politician, Christ with just looking at people as his sons and daughters and looking at people as his brethren, right? He gave honor to everybody. That doesn't mean there was not distinct roles, okay? The history of the church proved this. Um, when we look in Acts 6.6 6 or Acts 8 or Acts 13 or 1 Timothy 4.14, all of that, the laying of the hands, that act of the laying of the hands, that's the sacrament of priesthood. Right? When we hear in the New Testament the word elder, that's in Greek that's presbyter, right? Priest. That's the the thing that we say set apart, quote unquote, in the Old Testament, right? They are they are priests set apart for the work of the Lord. Previously on how to Coptic. There are three different types or like different categories of priests described in the Old Testament. And that is also mirrored in the New Testament. So let's start with the Old Testament, okay? In Exodus 19, the Israelites are described as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, okay? That's one type of priest. In the same chapter, there's a different set of priests described. Um, it says, And also the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves lest the Lord break out upon them. Okay, that's another type of priest. So the third type is the high priest, which in the Old Testament, that was Aaron. Okay, so these are three different types of priests in the Old Testament. Then in the New Testament, obviously Christ is considered the high priest. That's one type. Another type is described in 1 Peter chapter 2, and it describes Christians as a royal priesthood. Okay, so these two are paralleled in the OT. This leaves us with one more. The disciples. The disciples were also considered like priests or bishops and were given the same duties as priests in the OT. We also see this when Christ gave them the power to forgive sins. So this is in John 20 where Christ said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. It's also seen in Matthew 18, 18, where Christ says, Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So the three different types of priests are described in both the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Truly, again, uh, can you, do you not think it's a little weird that we have priesthood in the Old Testament and then priesthood in the book of Revelation, meaning in heaven? And then people will start claiming, oh, there's no priesthood in the middle. And they're just saying, like, it's Jesus Christ. Okay, yeah, we agree. He's the high priest. But did, did he not elect anybody? Did he not elect apostles? So why did he elect apostles? 
Why in Acts 8, when Philip converted all of Samaria and baptized them, he had to go make sure the apostles in Jerusalem know that he baptized so many. So the apostles, the elders, the ones ordained, can come and lay their hands on the people and make sure they're chrismated. Make sure the Holy Spirit dwells on the people. Have you ever read Acts 8? Anybody that questions priesthood, what the heck is going on in Acts 8? This, th these concepts are clear in the Bible, right? But uh, we don't look. Acts 8 clearly establishes order in the church. Clearly establishes that, again, Jesus really did appoint apostles. Really did appoint people like he did in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, if you read, again, if Deuteronomy, again, the Lord is clearly saying, hey, you guys are all like a holy priesthood, a holy nation. Again, literally like... Just read the next book, and it's talking about set apart for me the tribe of Levi. If that's the case in the Old Testament, and that's the case in the New Testament, because there's elders and there's apostles, and not everybody can lay their hand on the people, only the apostles. Okay, so then there's order in the church. God, our God, is, as as St. Paul says, our God is not a God of confusion. Our God is our God of order, a God of order. And he likes to help us participate in him. He likes, even though he's doing all the work, he, he likes us to be involved. He likes us to do our part. Again, that's why, again, even in heaven, the angels are the one uh, sensing up incense to God. And again, the book of Revelation says that that's the prayer of the saints. Does God need that? No. But he does it anyway. He involves the saints. He involves the angels in order to help us be saved. Let's get back to the main subject. We discussed the different types of priesthood, and Tina explained the three types in, in the Old Testament, the three types in the New Testament, and yes, the high priest in the New Testament is absolutely Christ, and there are other types of priesthood. They're all derived from Christ. They're all working for God, for mediation, just like we see in the book of Revelation, just like we see in the Old Testament, just like we see in the New Testament, right? When we hear the term elder or presbyter and in Greek, again, that means set apart person that God chose to be his vessel. Some people are going to start saying, you know what? Maybe we don't really know the difference between a bishop and a priest and a deacon in the New Testament. The language could be a little, let's say, muddy, right? It's, it's all very cloudy, right? We don't, maybe they're sometimes used interchangeably, sometimes... St. Paul says that he is a servant of Christ, or, I mean, servant means diacon, right? So sometimes these terms are like, oh, shoot, did he just call himself a servant, a deacon? But he's a, isn't he a bishop because he's one of the, the apostles and he was going from city to city, as it says in the book of Acts, and, and laying his hands and setting elders in every church? That means he's the bishop. So, yes, we agree that the terminology used in the New Testament may not be totally... I mean, again, we're being very clear here. We're being very honest about it, right? The terminology in the New Testament may not be clearly stating the difference between a priest, a bishop, and a, and a deacon because there was no need to make it clear, right? When St. Paul was saying, I am a servant, he's being humble here, right? So, if, I mean, he's not going to say, I'm the bishop and follow me, right? Or when St. Peter uses a similar term of saying, He's a priest, of course. Again, I know I'm, I'm deviating a little bit, but priests and bishops, yes, they're different administratively. And bishops have the ability to ordain priests. But when we're talking about the grace given to priests and bishops, there is no higher grace than the ability to, through your hands, God transforms bread into the body of the Son of God and the wine into the blood of the Son of God. There is no higher honor than that. Therefore, actually, when St. Peter claims and says, I am a priest, he's saying that this grace of priesthood is in me, right? Again, the bishop and the priest have the same grace of being able to, through them, God works and the Eucharist happens. Okay, so I understand that the language Maybe a little bit for somebody that looks at it from a non scholarly eye and looks at it firsthand and just look, looks at the Greek for the first time and they're like, hmm, you know what? 
maybe they're not very clear here. Maybe there is no orders in the church. But if we look, for example, at writings from the Apostolic Fathers, if we look at St. Ignatius of Antioch, for example, if for those of you who are not familiar, Ignatius of Antioch was a bishop of Antioch, of course, and he um, was martyred around the year 110 AD. Okay, so we're only talking, I mean, very, very near to the apostles. He's, he, he saw the apostles, he was discipled by Saint John and, and, and others as well, right? So this is the teachings of the apostles because this is the teachings of Christ. And Saint Ignatius, in his epistle to the Magnesians 13, he says what? Take care, therefore, to be confirmed in the decrees of the Lord and of the apostles, in order that in everything you do, you may prosper in body and soul, in faith and in love, in Son, Son of God, and in Father and in Spirit, for those who don't think the Trinity existed back then, okay? In beginning and in end, together with your most reverend bishop, with that fittingly woven spiritual crown, and the presbytery and with the deacons men of god be subject to the bishop and to one another as jesus christ is subject to the father and the apostles were subject to christ and to the father so that there may be unity in both body and spirit what does that tell you in the same sentence he mentions bishops presbyters priests and deacons and this is 110 ad oh there was a distinction oh there was ranks in the church Oh, Act 8 was not wrong. Oh, actually, no. Our God is a God of order. And our God respects order and loves order. Actually, good segue in 1 Corinthians 14, St. Paul is talking about order and he's talking about how let all things be done for edification. And then later in verse 33, he says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. And that's why actually St. Paul, in the verse right after, he talks about women. And that's the famous verse where everybody's like, how dare St. Paul say, women can't speak up. I mean, he's talking about order in the church. That's all it is. He's talking about a specific situation where he's setting things in place. And if, again, if you're familiar with 1 Corinthians, there's, there's a lot of problems in the church of Corinth. And he's addressing problems. It's not just something vague. He's talking about order in the church. And he's saying there needs to be order. Bishop, priests, presbyters, and deacons. So the office of bishopric, the office of priesthood, and the office of deacon were all present from the very first century, and they were distinct. They were different. This is not something made up, and it's not some hierarchy that the church created to control anybody. This is how it was from the very beginning. If you don't like it, you can't, I mean, that's fine. Follow your own religion, but that's not Christianity. With that said, though, before we start talking about deacons, male deacons and female deacons, let's talk about how this is maybe a personal opinion, but motherhood is on par with priesthood and importance, in my humble opinion. God allows for women to co-create with him in the process of giving birth of a human person on the image of God. Giving birth to an image of God. Think about that for a second. That's a big deal. Just like God gives some women that responsibility and privilege, He gives some fewer men the responsibility and privilege to be set apart like He did with Aaron and his children and to be a vessel through which His grace works in the church and its sacraments. This is also a big deal and it should be respected and honored. Both are godly. Both are different offices. In one setting, the woman co-creates with God. Somehow God gives women the ability to be bearers of images of God. And then on the other hand, God uses men to also work with His grace to do things in the church like the sacraments. Both are godly. Both are from God. Both are big deals. Both are set apart for a purpose. Both are different and distinct, but also one in essence. To glorify God, that's the essence. Point three, God looks at all humanity as females. Look at the example or the parable of the five wise and the five foolish that the Lord said. Look at the parable of the wedding feast in the gospel according to St. Luke. 
Look at the Song of Songs. Look at the Wisdom of Solomon. Look at Isaiah. Look at how God talks to us in Hosea, in Jeremiah, in the book of Revelation even. He's always addressing humanity as a she, as my bride, as my church. If God is speaking to all humanity as females, being a female is an honor. It's not something to be ashamed of, and it's not something that is less than males. Actually, again, this is another personal opinion. This is not a fatherly opinion, but, uh, I mean, we'll see what you think of this. But I think women, this is, again, I repeat, this is not something from the church. This is my opinion, okay? I think women can feel and understand God's love for us a little more than men. Why? Because I think God gave women the ability to love in a specific way that men sometimes struggle doing or feeling. Of course, men love in their own way, and I, maybe women don't understand that, right? We both are images of God, therefore we see God in both. But at the same time, I think women feel for God in a way, right? Again, just forgive me for the... I know this is not theologically the most accurate thing, but I hope the concept is understood. Being a woman is an honor. With that said, we established that priesthood is for males because the Lord made the males the ones who are disciples, even though he had many chances to ordain others as priests, he did not. So priesthood is for males. And if anybody just tries to cross that line, please Forgive me, and I'm not responsible. Me and Tina here are not responsible in front of God for what you're about to use the next couple of minutes of information we're about to give you. If you use that info to start crossing that line of females being priests, if you try to cross that line with information we're about to say, I mean, I'm washing my hands from this one. It's not on me. That one is on you. You have to deal with God on that one. The office of the female deacon is the ministry of women. It's being set apart for the ministry of women. And we're going to see that. I'm going to go quickly through some history about that. The office of the female deacon or diaconate is very clear throughout history. Many examples. Okay. Let me also preface my comments by saying in history, sometimes because history was mostly written by males. Okay. And it's not part of, I mean, we don't fault them for it. History, especially church history, is written a lot by monks. Okay, so you got you got to put that in perspective. No monk is gonna sit there and start talking about women. Okay, that's that's literally what they're. I mean, you you get what I'm saying. Okay, just like nuns are not gonna just sit there all day thinking about males, right? So that's that's just that's how things go. So when in history, there is a mention of a woman that was a deacon or a woman in general doing something great, that should tell you that there is like so much more that's not written, okay? So again, just because there's a scarcity of resources on this, okay? And we're gonna mention books, and of course there's still resources. There's a lot of examples. Um, at least 16 women in history that we know of just in the first six centuries that were ordained female diaconate from the female diaconate order. This is not something um, that didn't exist or we made up later. Or, no, no, the disorder existed. Okay, so, um, but let's talk just, for example, about St. Gregory of Nyssa when he was writing about his sister, St. Macrina. So, again, we sometimes, in cases like that, we know for sure that, for example, St. Macrina was actually an ordained um, or I mean, ordained, quote-unquote, deacon, right? Deacon meaning female deacon. In other cases, we don't know if they were actually blessed with this kind of um, official title or she was, like, the, the person was doing already the job, so we just call her a deacon, okay? So, for example, we don't know if uh, Phoebe, the deaconesses, or Phoebe the deacon, was she blessed by the apostles to be called a deacon, or was she just doing it? And the apostles, because of her amazing work, like what St. Paul says in Romans 16, that's why he called her a deacon, because she was doing amazing things, right? And she was 
pretty much carrying the church, right? Doing everything. Okay, so um, we don't know that distinction. Okay, so just again, we're being very honest with this subject. Okay, someone smart will say, "Hey, you're just talking about great women. You're not talking about the deacon, the female diaconate." So I'm gonna tell you this. In First Timothy three, it talks about deacons, male deacons, and then it starts talking about women. The verse goes, verse 8, Likewise, deacons must be fervent, not double-tongued, not given much to wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of faith with a pure conscience. But let these also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderous, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be husbands of one wife, ruling their children in their own households well. For those who have served well as deacons, obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is Christ Jesus. This looks like they're talking about deacons. Now all of a sudden, they're talking about their wives. That's about it. Actually, the fathers talk about Timothy 3, some of the fathers talk about Timothy 3 as male deacons and then female deacons who are married to male deacons. St. Clement of Alexandria wrote about 1 Timothy 3 in his Stromae 3, 6, and 53, right? In all of these, he mentions that the women that St. Paul is mentioning here, and I quote, the apostles, quote, took with them women, not wives, but rather as sisters, so they may serve as their co-ministers. Again, look at the Greek of the co-ministers. Again, I'm not, I'm not a linguist. I'm sorry. But um, I'm sure there's a lot of Greek experts that, that can back up what I'm saying right now. Okay, look at the word that's used for co-ministers. Okay, again, I'm going to continue the quote by St. Clement of Alexandria. Serving women who were confined to their homes. He's talking about women deacons who were married to male deacons. Serving women who were confined to their homes, through them, the Lord's teaching was also able to enter the restricted domains of women without causing ill will. We are also aware of all things the notable Paul prescribed on the subject of women deacons in one of the two epistles of Timothy. All of this was a direct quote from St. Clement of Alexandria. Okay, so is this the only father that talked about 1 Timothy 3? In this slide, no. Origen also mentioned the same thing. I know it's controversial, I understand, but we're trying to understand the historiosity of something here. So we're trying to just mention sources that mention this idea of a female diaconate, female deacon, okay? I'm going to skip through a little bit, but this is Origen's commentary on Romans 10, 17. What is he saying? In the same manner, likewise, Abraham who also came forward to agree guests, deserved to have the Lord with his angel to visit him and to stay under his tent. Also despised Phoebe while giving assistance and rendering service to all, deserved to assist and to serve the apostle himself. And thus this text teaches at the same time two things. That there are, as we have already said, women deacons in the church, and that women who have given assistance to so many people and who by their good works deserve to be praised by the apostles ought to be accepted in the diaconate. That's a direct quote. All right, Origen is a controversial uh, figure. All right, fine. Look at St. John Chrysostom's commentary on Romans. I won't quote that one just for the sake of time, but you go look it up. You don't believe that one? Fine. Go look at St. John Chrysostom's commentary on 1 Timothy 3, not even Romans. He says, some have claimed that this was said of women generally. This is, I'm, I'm, this is a direct quote, direct quote. Some have claimed that this was said of women generally, but this is not so. For why should he introduce anything about women to interfere with his subject? He is speaking, rather, of those women who have the dignity of the diaconate. Let deacons be husbands of one wife. This is fitting to say of women deacons as well, as this order is also in the highest degree necessary, useful, and proper in the church. Theodore, Bishop of Cyrus, also mentions this on First Timothy 3 and Romans. Again, I'll stop right there, but again, many examples of this throughout history. There's archaeological evidence that proves the authenticity and, and the, the existence of the female diaconate. There's a 5th 
5th century Byzantine tombstone on the Mount of Olives, mentioning female diaconate. 5th century tombstone in Cappadocia. There's the letters to Pliny the Younger around 111 and 112 AD, mentioning female deacons who they kind of make fun of and say slaves, right? And they say that they were so important to the point that they had to be arrested and tortured and killed just like the men who were serving because they were so influential and they were preaching and they were doing a lot of good works. Of course, not according to Pliny because, again, that's a pagan author. Again, that's non-Christian speaking about Christians. Again, there's no bias here. It's like a proof of Christianity, proof of martyrdom, proof of everything, right? But go read it. Cool letter. With that said, before I move to the two biggest sources that we have on the female diaconate, let me just state, not every document supports this idea. And all I'm going to tell you is, Bishop Epiphanius has a letter that was found with St. Jerome, and he was not on board with the diaconate of females just because people took it too far okay so again if male and female we take this too far so then people like saint epiphanius are gonna come out and they're gonna say no and they're gonna be right to do so because again priesthood is for males that doesn't mean there was no diaconate for females but again if we cross that line then better not to, again, we don't want to be heretics. We don't want to be say false things. We don't want to be against truth, against Christ. All right, you know what? I don't I don't really believe anything you just said, and I don't, I don't like the sources you just mentioned, and, you know, I, I need more sources. All right, here you go. Next two sources, best two sources. Syriac Didiscalia, which is a document written in the early parts of the 3rd century, it claims to be from the apostles, okay? So this is what most likely happened is this is a rewriting of the Dedicate, okay? So this is, they took the teaching of the apostles from the first century, and again, this is the teachings of the church, right? How the church was, the, the system of the order of the church, okay? That's the first document. The second document is the Apostolic Constitutions, okay? The Apostolic Constitution came... Again, a little later, right, in the 4th century. And it, it it's, again, it's another version from the Syriac Didiscalia. Okay, so we have the Dedicae in the 1st century, and then the Syriac Didiscalia in the 3rd century, and then in the 4th century we have the Apostolic Constitutions. So, what did the Syriac Didiscalia say about the female deacons? Both documents discuss an office called the Office of the Widow, the Apostolic Constitutions discuss the office of virgins as well. The office of the widow and virgin are both characterized by the exercise of asceticism. In both offices, women were pledged to chastity and the life of prayer. The office of the widow is likely the older of the two because what we see in 1 Corinthians when St. Paul was talking about virginity. Both of these are and I quote, to be honored in the assembly, end quote. And with the blessing of the bishop, again, I'm, again this, is, this is what they're saying, right, in, in these documents. And with the blessing of the bishop, blessing, and I'm stressing on that, neither the widows nor the virgins are viewed as ordained according to the Diascala or the Apostolic Constitutions. Again, my apologies for my bad pronunciation. Both the widow and the virgin are viewed as part of the laity. Then comes the women deacon. Okay, so we have the office of widow, the office of the virgin, they're part of the laity, and then we have the women deacon. Both the Diascala and the Apostolic Constitution associate the women deacon with the other ordained orders of the church. Their responsibilities are discussed within the same context as the deacon, the presbyter, and the bishop in the Diascala. In the Apostolic Constitutions, the responsibilities of the women deacon are discussed together with those of the subdeacon and the doorkeeper. So not ordained, like a priest or a full deacon or a bishop, not a priest, but not a widow or a virgin office either. It's somewhere in the middle. The apostolic constitutions mention the rights of blessing, quote unquote, or ordination for male and female deacons being very similar. Women were, quote, 
set apart, end quote, to perform specialized service to the community. For the scholars out there, Canon 15 of a council we don't like mentions something about the female diaconate as well. Proof of authenticity of the office. Also, if you look in the novels or collections of Emperor Justinian, or Justinian, at some point he says, and I quote, 100 male and 40 female deacons. Okay, he mentions it in there. Okay, go look it up. So again, the female diaconate, according to what we just said, is set apart for specific work. So what is the ministry of the male deacon and the female deacon? Because they're different, okay? Just because they have the same honor, as we said in the very beginning. They have the same honor, same dignity, same everything. But they're different, okay? Both the didiscalia and the constitutions agree that the ministry of the woman or the women deacon is directly related to the bishop. Remember this because it's going to be very important when we're discussing current subjects right now. The ministry of women deacon is related directly to the bishop. She had a major role in assisting the bishop, especially in baptism of women and in their catechetical formation. According to the Didiscalia, much of the ministry of the women deacon was to women, paralleling the ministry of the male deacon to men. Both were assistants to the bishop and each had to give an account of their ministries to him. I can remember that directly to the bishop. The apostolic constitutions mention that the male deacons assist the bishop or presbyter during the celebration of the Eucharist, while the ministry of the deaconesses did not. According to the apostolic constitutions, no woman was permitted to speak to the bishop or even the deacon without first speaking to the female deacon. Just like St. Paul was speaking that the church should have order because our God is not a God of chaos, the apostolic constitutions add a prohibition which forbids the deaconesses from speaking. And the context here is speaking in church. And actually, if you remember some, again, I'm just adding some context to this. Origen couldn't even speak or give sermons in the presence of bishops. And that's why, again, many scholars think that's why he was ordained a priest by a non-Alexandrian bishop. And that's why the Alexandrian bishop got mad. Okay, so if you have no idea what I just said, ignore. But all you need to know is no one spoke in the presence of a bishop or a priest. It was an abomination. It's not something you're supposed to do. That's why, actually, maybe Origen was ordained priest outside of Alexandria. Just a thought. So the prohibition of speaking here, when we're talking about female deacons, that's just, again, just like everybody else, that's not ordained. When the bishop, the priest, the ordained, fully ordained deacon is present, of course, any other person should not speak. The Didiscalia states, For this cause, we say that the ministry of a woman deacon is especially needful and important for our Lord and Savior, also was ministered unto by women ministers, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the daughter of James and the mother of Josie, the mother of the sons of Zebedee, with other women besides. End quote. Then the, the Discalia says, speaking to the bishop, it states, and I quote, And you, O bishop, also have the need of the ministry of a female deacon for many things. End quote. According to the Apostolic Constitutions, women deacons must be, and I quote, ready to carry messages, to travel about, to minister, and to serve. End quote. Clearly, according to all these documents, the female diaconate office does not appear to assist the bishop at the Eucharist in the same way the male deacon does. For scholars, the ones who have been reading into the history of the female diaconate and know exactly what happened in the 7th and 8th and 9th century in the non-Oriental Orthodox churches. I understand where your head is going right now. I'm ignoring it on purpose because, again, not everything that happened later centuries, in my opinion, is correct. But even then, the last statement I said is true in all ages. According to all these documents, the female deacon 
does not appear to assist the bishop at the Eucharist in the same way the male deacon does. Period. So let's summarize the job description of a woman deacon, a female deacon according to the sources from or before the 5th century. 1. Assist the bishop, especially in baptism of women and their catechetical education and formation. 2. Ministering to women, just like male deacons minister to men, in addition to male deacons' liturgical duties. Right? So ma men or male deacons have liturgical duties in addition to serving men, not for women. 3. Serve women in their homes. 4. Women deacons let the exchange of the kiss of peace with the women during the Eucharist. 5. She was the keeper of the doors, just like the male deacon. 6. Responsibility to keep the women in order. 7. Receive female visitors into the worshipping community. 8. Acting under the direction of the bishop directly, just like the male deacon. 9. Female deacons distributed the charitable donations of the church to the needy women in the congregation, including widows. 10. Provided pastoral care on behalf of the Christian community, specifically to women. 11. Acting with the bishop's blessing, she visited and ministered to the sick. This is the job description. This is, according to all the sources we have, the job description of a female deacon. Some people are going to ask, why don't we have the female deacon order fully intact right now in every church? In order to answer that question, let me tell you, in the Coptic Orthodox Church, the roles of deacons. There's five levels. The only ordained deacon, the actual deacon, are the last two levels. The full deacon and the archdeacon. Okay, so those are the, the last two. The first three are, so it goes, I'm going to just go through them in a kind of a hierarchy kind of deal which we're going to actually discuss. That's the wrong idea of looking at it. But anyway, first one is singer. That's the first level. Second one is reader. And then subdeacon. And then deacon. And then archdeacon. Five levels. First one is singer. You sing. Outside the altar, you sing. You lead people in singing, in worshiping. Second one is reading and teaching. It's a reader. Third one is subdeacon. That is helping the full deacon or the deacon. And then the full deacon, the one that is paralleled by the female diaconate, and then the archdeacon. When we talk about order in the church, there are orders based on the grace given. What does that mean? Meaning, as we said in the very beginning of this episode, the presbyter, the priest, and the bishop both can, through them, God works, and the bread becomes the body, and the wine becomes the blood of Christ, the Eucharist. Therefore, the priest and the bishop, in a way, have that same grace. The bishop have an extra kind of grace where they, they can lay their hands and ordain other priests. Okay, so that's two kinds of graces here, right? As we said, there's nothing higher than the grace of, again, being able to perform the Eucharist, but there is a distinction. Just like the apostles were going around ordaining elders in every church, the bishops can do the same. Same thing with a deacon, male or female. They're both a different order of the church. They are there to help, as we see in the book of Acts, and non, um, let's call it sacramental things. Things that are not priesthood related. Okay, They're helping the ministers of Christ to make sure the flock of Christ is in good care. Let's put it this way. Let's put that aside and think about this with, for a second with me. You hear the term Archbishop or you hear the term in Coptic Chori Episcopus or bishop assistant, or you hear 
other terms as metropolitan. Those are all bishopric orders. What does that mean? They're all the same level of grace. They're all bishops. At the end of the day, they're all bishops. Okay? Just because um, they have been, and I quote, elevated into another one, right? They're over a metropolis. Therefore, they became metropolitans. That doesn't mean different grace dwelt on them. No, no, no. We're not changing what the Lord and the disciples delivered to us, right? These are just administratively different. Priesthood is just priesthood. It just has different ranks inside, right? It's just for, again, administrative reasons. No difference in grace. So bishops, all the same, even whatever you want to call it, archbishop, bishop, choripuscopus, metropolitan, all of them are bishops. The end of the day, all of them, the same grace. Priest, same thing. Presbyter, same thing. Priest or uh, proto-priest or um, archpriest or higaman. All again, all these are like synonyms for the same thing, right? They're all, again, just two ranks of priesthood. And it's not ranks in grace. It's just ranks administratively. Same idea with deacons in the Coptic Orthodox Church. There is five, technically, five ranks of deacons. The first three, and I quote, Deacons, the first three ranks of quote unquote deacons are not actually deacons. They're blessings. They're not actually laying of the hands and an actual ordination here, right? When we talk about the singers, they're just laymen. Just this is like the office of the widow or the office of the virgins when we talked about that. So the singers are just laity, but it's an honorary rank, right? We the, the bishop puts their cross and they give the blessing, right? Hey. You are now officially recognized as a singer in the church. Second rank is reader. Of course, when you're reading, you're teaching, right? So this is also another one that's not a priestly rank. It's not a, a, an ordained, quote-unquote, or laying of the hand rank, as it says in the book of Acts. The subdeacon is the same thing. The subdeacon is supposed to... Be helping the deacon prepare the things for the altar, preparing the censer, preparing the candles, preparing the books, opening the books to the right uh, day, um, keeping, making sure the church is clean, making sure the doors are closed, making sure, and I quote, cats are outside, not inside the church, right? The, literally what it mentions, right? It's just more responsibilities of taking care of things. It's also not a priestly order. It's not an ordination, quote unquote. It's just a blessing. Okay. Where we get to the actual ordination is the full deacon. The full deacon and the archdeacon are also the same order. Making sense? So why did you never hear of that before? Why is that a new thing? Because we don't really do this nowadays. We lost this a little bit throughout time. All of a sudden, we, through circumstances that maybe we all have time to mention... We lost some of this order in the church. Everything just became mixed. Anybody can enter the altar now in the Coptic church. Why? We can discuss that in a bit. But in the first place, what things should be like is no one can enter the Holy of Holies unless you are a full and fully ordained, recognized priest, meaning a bishop or a priest, or a full deacon, or archdeacon, of course. But these three are the only ones that are supposed to be entering the altar. Of course, the problem became that because male deacons started abusing their power. Here's, here's the, the, the recent issues we started having. The last couple of popes, the last couple of archbishops, started seeing that the male deacons started abusing their power. If you've ever heard of the Maglis al-Milli at some point, okay? It'll just trigger things in your head. If you have not, read the book uh, Silent Patriarch. It'll give you a little bit of the insight into some of the problems our church has been facing in the past. But all you need to know is deacons were abusing this power. They started saying, no, um, Archbishop, you can't do this, you can't do that. And they started actually attacking him publicly. So what happened is, the bishop started saying, okay, you're not going to be obedient. Fine. No ordinations. What happened is 
less ordinations, less deacons, less de less talking about full deacons here. Less full deacons, less full deacons, less full deacons, and all of a sudden, instead of every church having a couple of full deacons that can enter the altar and help the priest, you have zero. So what happens? All of a sudden, the subdeacon has to step in and actually serve an altar. And then all of a sudden, there is no subdeacons. I remember being in a church when I was younger where there was no subdeacons. Like nothing. Like I think there was like one and he was like 70. Right? He can't even serve an altar. Right? So all of a sudden, the subdeacons can't serve an altar. Therefore, who serves? Now the singers and the readers have to serve an altar. So all the, the order just got messed up. So now people are going to say, oh, why did the female diaconate disappear? It's not something against women. The problem is bigger. The problem is that the deacon office in general just kind of dropped. It kind of got diminished. When we say deacons nowadays, it's just we're talking about singers, aren't we? But being a deacon, male or female, is actually mainly about something else. It's about being servants of the feet, helping the bishop and the priest to take care of the flock of Christ. But that has all been just reduced to just straight up singing. That's not how it was. That's not how it should be. So the problem is not just male and female. It's the, the problem is that the deacon office as a whole disappeared. So the problem is not just the persecution of women in the church. It's the diaconate order just kind of diminishing as a whole. And why did the diaconate order diminish as a whole? Is it just the things I was telling you about Magnus and Milly or problems with the archbishop or anything like that? No. There's other factors. First factor is that we were influenced by the Catholic idea of the diaconate. In the Catholic Church, it's like a staircase. Of course, they don't have the same names for these ranks, but... Let's just roll with the names we have in the Catholic Church. But we have what? Singer, reader, subdeacon, deacon, archdeacon. And then we as Copts start thinking now as what? After archdeacon as what? Priest, and then Higeman, and then bishop, and then metropolitan, and then archbishop. We just think of it as like a staircase. And it's just gradual increase. And all of a sudden, deacons, the office of, of, of deacon became a stepping stone to priesthood. When we think of deacons, we think of potential priests. Why? And that's the problem we're having right now. That's why actually when we talk to people in Egypt about the female deacons, they start talking, what are you saying? This is blasphemy. Because their idea of a deacon itself is distorted. The deacon has nothing to do with priesthood. Yes, you can choose from deacons to become priests. Fine. But the deacon order was not made so you can just nominate priests. The deacon order is an administrative one, just like we see in the book of Acts, taking care of the tables, taking care of the people, making sure everybody, like when I went to Kenya, for example, and in Kenya, the deacons are the ones that take care of the visitation. They're the ones that know the areas. So there was one priest and he's covering like four villages, five villages. In every single one of these villages, deacons know the people. They're the ones that follow up with the people daily. Therefore, when the priest comes and visits the village, the, the deacon is the one that takes the priest and, hey, Abuna, this family is going through this, this family is going through this, and here, let me uh, introduce you to this new family, etc. So the role of the deacon is to, to be the link between the priest and the bishop to the people. But also another thing, in addition to this idea of the Catholic hierarchy of things infiltrating our church. There's another thing that infiltrated our church due to this concept of the staircase. All of a sudden, if you remember, when we were talking about the responsibilities of the female and male deacons in the Apostolic Constitution and in the, the Discalia, it said that the male and female deacons report directly to the bishop not the priest. You see now where, where, where we're, what's the problem? Because we made it a, a staircase, all of a sudden we just started thinking automatically deacon and then priest and then bishop. No, it doesn't work like that. It's actually deacons straight to bishop because the priest has a different role. He has a sacramental role, a liturgical role, 
that he focuses on. Of course, a pastoral role, and we're not denying that, but the deacons, male and female, report directly to the bishop. The female deacon is supposed to be taking care of the females in the congregation. Every female, for example, taking care of 50, taking care of 25, taking care of 20, whatever it is. But then they would report to the bishop about the state of these 20. Same idea with the male deacons. They would be reporting directly to the bishop about 50 males that they take care of, or 25 or 20. And they take care of these 50 or this group of males spiritually. And they take care of them physically. And they take care of them in every aspect of life. So male and female deacons are there to serve the people. That's their main goal. That's the main job. The word deacon in Greek literally means servant, a washer of the feet. As deacons, we take care of the congregation. The male deacon takes care of the male, and the female takes care of the females. Of course, the males have the liturgical role, but that's aside from the main role. Hey, uh, this person is struggling. Hey, this person needs help. Hey, this person needs a visit. Hey, this person needs uh, the Eucharist. Or, hey, this person wants to confess. In the first place, as uh, if you if you remember when we were going over the rules, one of the rules was no one can speak to the bishop, or the priest, or the deacon, from the women unless the female deacon knows. Wouldn't that solve so many of the problems that are in the churches? I I, I think you understand what I'm talking about. If two people are in a room together alone. Sure, the devil can work. But if there's light in that room, if there is a third person that knows about this meeting, what's the likelihood of something bad going on in that room? Not high. That's a good system. Checks and balances. The female deacon takes care of the females. And she is aware when the females are meeting with a male. Wow, that works. Why, why is that not a thing anymore? Because again, the whole system collapsed because we're starting to think of it, or we've been thinking of it as an hierarchy. It's just everything goes through the priest and then the bishop. And the priests are overloaded. They can't, I mean, you can't throw everything on, a th on the shoulders of priests and then, wow, how could they be so negligent? And I mean, they have so much on their plate. Another reason for the decline of the female diaconate Females in Islamic countries are treated as second tier. I think most of you know that. You see this very clearly in the Islamic worships. Women have to stand behind men when both of them are praying together. If you've been to one of these Islamic households, women, when they pray, must stand behind all the men, even the little kids. So it goes the head of the household, the man, the house ahead of the household, behind him, the other men, and then behind him, the kids and children, and then the women. So this idea of men being in the front or women being in the back, I don't think we have anything in the church that says that, I mean, females can't sing outside, for example. No, 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 we don't have anything like that. But because of the Islamic influence, this idea could have started getting into us because again we've we've been under Islamic influence since the seventh century. Long time. Two more reasons and then we're done. Women wanting the good but not accepting the hard scolding that comes with it. What does that mean? You sometimes people see the goodness of hey deacon, but then they don't see the bad. They don't see you getting scolded. They don't see you getting yelled at, to be honest, right? I've been yelled at by Two priests four times in the same day, in the same span of four hours on a Sunday morning, I got yelled at. Just because me and this other deacon were supposed to show up on time to the liturgy at 8.30, and we showed up 8.34. So we got yelled at by the first priest, and then the second priest didn't see us getting yelled at. So when he saw us, the second priest yelled us at again. And then when the, the liturgy was done, the both priests met together, decided it wasn't enough. So they met us a third time and yelled at us again. Okay? So, again, this sounds funny, but it, it's not funny when it's <laughs> happening. Okay? And it, and it, this happens, again, I'm not saying this is bad. It's okay. It humbles us. And I understand that it's good. But, same time, we need to, if we're going to really do this, and we're going to say, hey, 
we should recognize women offices. Then, we should not just say, oh, let's take the dandy and leave the rest. I mean, it's a package. <laughs> if we're going to actually do this, as it says in the Apostolic Constitution and in the Discalia, the deacons must submit and obey the bishop. Period. Done. If we see disobedience, again, that's ungodly feminism. And again, that's when things are going to go bad. The last point is, maybe Tina can elaborate. Sometimes the pitches are different. This is just a comment we heard at some point. Pitches are a little different sometimes, so it makes it difficult for leaders from from both male and female to lead together. So, But I think there's probably a solution for that. We just have to think of something. To conclude, when we talk about singers or readers or subdeacons in the church, this ordination we speak of is just a quote-unquote blessing. right? We say it's an ordination, but it's just a blessing. Either for the first three levels of deaconship or female diaconate or, again, all of these, again, they're, they're not the priestly orders that we're talking about that perform the sacraments. Okay, So while we hope one day we recognize that it's okay for the church to bless the women of these ranks just like they bless the men, we don't look for titles. Titles are just that. Titles. The core of service is what describes what we are, who we are. After all, St. Mary wasn't given a title when she was the mother of God, right? We gave her that title later. Jesus even said, if you follow my words, you are my brother, my mother, and sister. I mean, if she was looking for titles, she would have probably wanted that title alone to be his mother. St. Mary didn't have titles. And she became the most glorified human because she was worthy to be the bearer of God. We work, we serve, we wash the feet. And if God allows for earthly titles, yeah, we thank Him and we work to use that talent. If God sees fit to give us titles or new names, as it says in Revelations 2, or to reward us openly after our departure, that's fine as well. As Job said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This is how to Coptic. Orthodox Project. See you next time.